Hi, you normal and hello freshman students from the BSEMT. Welcome back to our YouTube channel. In today's video, we're going to discuss about human flourishing. So sit back, listen, and enjoy learning. And these are the learning outcomes for today's discussion. At the end of the lesson, the student should able to discuss how science and technology contribute in human flourishing. Second, analyze human condition in order to reflect and express one's views. And lastly, critique human flourishing vis-a-vis -vis the progress of science and technology. So, let us fasten our seatbelt as we discuss the human flourishing in science and technology. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Let us begin by understanding human flourishing. The term human flourishing is the modern connotation of the Greek term eudaimonia, which was used by Aristotle to also mean or also mean doing and living well, being happy or to be of good spirit. Human flourishing is the highest good of human endeavors. It is towards which all actions aim, according to Eukins in 2003. It is also a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good and are considered a state as complete human well-being, and that is according to Van der Weyle in 2017. Now let us proceed to the characteristics of human flourishing. Human flourishing is characterized as follows. First, it is the natural end of individual human actions. It means all humans seek to flourish. Second, it involves rational activities and capacities such as talents, abilities, and virtues, and therefore, it is not passive. Third, it is developmental. It arises out of activity. A person has the ability to actualize his potential for being a fully developed human being. Fourth, it encompasses a wide variety of constitutive ends such as knowledge, the development of characters or character traits, productive work, religious pursuit, community building, love, charitable activities, allegiance, person and causes, self-efficacy, material being, pleasurable sensations, as well as goodness, growth, and resilience. Fifth, it is dependent on free will. It means everyone depends on his or her rational for survival and flourishing. Human action is governed by choices and choice is free. Choice is the product of free will and free will means being a moral agent. Sixth, it requires doing or being well in five broad domains of human life, namely happiness and life satisfaction, mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships according to Van der Willey in 2017. 7. It involves education and good habits. Education provides proper training to develop good habits that enable everyone to flourish. 8. It is not only a momentary state, rather, it is something that is sustained over time. Hence, financial and material resources must be sufficiently stable. And lastly, it requires the practice of virtues. A virtue is a trait of character that enables a person to flourish. According to Seligman in 2002, human flourish encompasses six virtues and 24 strength, 
which are the following. First is we have knowledge and wisdom, creativity, curiosity, open-mindedness, love of learning, perspective, and innovative. Second is courage. It is associated with persistence, integrity, vitality, and zest. Third, humanity, associated with love, kindness, and social intelligence. Fourth, is justice. It is associated with citizenship, fairness, and leadership. Fifth, temperance. It is also associated with self-control, mercy, humility, and prudence. And lastly, we have transcendence, associated with gratitude, hope, humor, spirituality, appreciation of beauty, and excellence. discuss further about human flourishing in science and technology. In the modern era, advanced science and emerging technologies and innovation continue to play a major role in the transformation of society and in building the nation. They persist as an active agent in the constitution of the new human nature and identity. They are instrumental in bringing for reaching social and economic changes that expectedly would contribute to everyone's well-being, that is, all aspects of a person or person's life are good. The concept of human flourishing in science and technology offers a wide view of human good that is objective, means human good or well-being is viewed objectively because it is desirable and appealing. Both science and technology function on this basis. Both express and produce the actualization of human potentials. Moreover, the vast knowledge and truth that science offers and the wide array of materials and resources that technology produces are desirable and appealing. They satisfy human needs and interests. They, also, they even contribute to everyone's well-being. They promote good living. Although science, technology, and innovation have advanced drastically through the years, they alone do not cause human flourishing. Their essence, purpose, value, and extent of use contribute to the attainment of human well-being, self-fulfillment, and happiness. While they deal with the progress, research, and development to find solutions to social and economic problems, they must be managed righteously. To flourish is to live according to what holds the greatest value in life. This implies that in order to achieve true human flourishing, human must encourage or engage actively in ethical and meaningful scientific work and technological undertakings. The basic principle of ethics and morality, including the virtue, should not be sacrificed in one's desire to, pr to pursue opportunities that led to the new scientific discovery and technological innovations. Rather, ethics and morality should serve as a guiding light in one's quest for greater heights and to flourish in terms of science and technology. Now let us define alienation from the different perspectives. From the perspective of capitalism, alienation is the condition of isolating individuals from a group or from an activity to which they should belong or in which they should be involved. For instance, workers lose control of their vocation. They are reduced to, be a, to a mere commodity of production. According to Karl Marx, alienation is the entrenchment 
of people from aspect of their species essence as a consequence of living in a society of stratified social classes as a consequence of urbanization and modernization. In his work entitled Economic and Philosophic Manuscript of 1844, German philosopher economist Karl Marx pointed out that as human flourishes, human alienation may possibly occur. This means that as a consequence of living in a capitalist society, workers distance themselves from humanity. According to Simon in 2018, this implies that a person loses the ability to determine his or her own life and destiny. The person could not direct actions and define relationships with the other people. Now we are down to the last part which is the four types of alienation according to Karl Marx. First, alienation of the workers from their product. A worker has no say or does not have control over the design and development of what are intended to be produced because decisions are in the hands of the capitalist, not of the workers. Second, alienation of worker from the act of production. The production of goods and services offer little or no psychological satisfaction to the worker. Labor seems coercive because a worker undertakes this as a means of survival. Third, alienation of the worker from their species essence. The species essence of a person comprises of all or his or her innate potentials, but these potentials are either recognized nor maximized for self-development. The person is forced to sell his or her labor power as a market commodity. And lastly, alienation of the worker from other workers. In a capitalist society, a worker competes against another worker. Labor is traded in a competitive labor market instead of considering it as a constructive socio-economic activity characterized by collective common effort. Human interaction are impersonal. Alright, so that's the end of our discussion, but let me leave you with this quotation. Imagination is better than knowledge. Knowledge is limited to all we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever to know and to understand. That's according to Albert Einstein. And these are the references that I made use for this topic. Thank you for learning with me today, but please don't forget to click the like button and subscribe. See you on my next discussion. Goodbye!